Um, so uh, let me let me start out by introducing our speaker, uh, Bjorn Orhagen Sunda, and uh, please correct my pronunciation. I'm still not great on Norwegian vowels and things, but uh, uh, is uh, he's a, a very distinguished professor of legal history. Uh, he's uh, a national and international expert on uh, Nordic law going back for uh, uh, centuries, uh, back to the 13th century. Uh, and uh, he's currently working on a project to uh, in investigate the effect of technology. So going from uh, oral uh, expression of the law to written to uh, uh, printed, and now finally to digital, and you know how that affects the understanding of law and policing and so forth. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that recently I, I came across that impressed me very, very much was um, that I was surfing around on the web, I mentioned this earlier, um, and uh, came to the Uskadal website, and uh, uh, they were, uh, uh, they, they clearly recognize uh, Joran as a, a major expert in legal history and so forth, but they're very appreciative of the fact that he uh, does a lot of work on history in, in the area. We heard him about a year ago on the Rosendahl barony, uh, but he comes back, I, I think, almost annually to talk about uh, uh, history in, in, in his hometown, basically. Um, and the, he was uh, speaking recently uh, just a couple of weeks ago on actually one of the daughters of Christopher Tronson, who is referred to as the Scottish lady, uh, another who's, who's uh, also very interesting in her own right. Uh, the, uh, and so let me uh, wrap up this uh, introduction. I could kind of, I could probably use up all of our time and talk about all of the honors and, and so forth that, that he's accumulated. He's, uh, uh, extremely well regarded uh, uh, in this in this area, but uh, let me just finish with uh, one of the reasons why this topic is of, of very significant interest to me, and that's uh, in 1953, my uncle did a family tree of for my grandmother and my grandfather, and everybody in the family got a copy of it, and, and maybe 10 years ago or so, I pulled them out and started pouring through it. And, and found that there was one name in common between these two family trees. Uh, it was Christopher Tronson. Uh, and uh, my grandmother was descended through one of his daughters and my grandfather was descended through another of daughters. So I, I thought, boy, this has gotta be a really interesting guy. And uh, he is, he's just about the most interesting uh, guy that, uh, that I've tried to uh, do research on. Uh, uh, unlike a lot of the people that uh, we find in the tree, we're able to find vital statistics and maybe a couple of little things. But uh, the stories on, on Christopher kind of go on and on, which is why we're really uh, pleased to have uh, somebody who I think is, is one of the major experts on Christopher Tronson uh, speaking to us today. So I'm going to turn it over to Jorn, Professor Sunda, please uh, take over. Thank you very much, Joel, for that very kind introduction and for this opportunity to, to speak of a person that I personally think is just so enormously interesting. And let's see if I can um, start sharing. Let's see. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I see your, your slides. Yes, yeah, so let's see if I can get it from the beginning. Um, Let's see. There you go. Slideshow icon. Let's see. You can see the first slide now, Christopher Tronson Rustin. Yes. Good. And can you also see it change? No. No. That's we just smart. see your computer screen with the little images down the left side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that we see change. And uh -huh. you're not in slideshow mode, which if the cursor at the very bottom, you're on the booklet, move it over to, no, next, 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 there. Okay. 
So can you now see it change? No. Still not. Hmm. Okay. We've seen this before. Yes. So let me just try once more. So let me stop sharing and try this again. This should be this simple. So let's see. Hmm. Now, for the last time, can can you see change now, or is it still just one slide? Uh, just one just slide. One slide. It's not in slideshow mode yet. Uh, so I still, it's. Um... But it will still work if you force it by going along the uh, left side. Yeah. So now you can see it change. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, let's just do it like that then. Uh, let, so, uh, let, let me just ask one other question. Uh, are you willing to share this uh, PowerPoint uh, with us? Yes, of course. Okay. No Thank problem. You. So I'll send it to you afterwards. And, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions <laughs> afterwards, they can also, I'll put my email on the slides so you can uh, write me easily if you have any questions. Thank you. So, Joel, you, you refer to him as Christopher Tronson, and that's what he's referred to in all the sources, the contemporary sources in the 16th century. Uh, Rüstung is a family name which is ascribed to him in first in the 17th century. I use it by habit. So uh, if you prefer to call him Christopher Tronson, that's probably more correct than Christopher Rüstung, but I'm still, because he was always talked of as, as Christopher Rüstung when I grew up in my family. So. I still do that by habit, but uh, probably Christopher Thornton is the most correct. And as you said, Joel, there's been many who have taken an interest in, in his character. And when I first gave a speech what I, on, on his history, I think it was five or six years ago, I simply relied on the same sources as everybody has done up till then uh, and just rereading them. But the last years, there's some new sources have been investigated and not prim primarily by me. So Scottish sources has been investigated by my old friend, Julian Goodard at the University of Edinburgh, while the Dutch sources has been uh, investigated by a new acquaintance of me, Louis Sicking, which is who is at the University in Leiden and Amsterdam. And especially for the period 7, 1536 till 1542, I'm going to rely heavily on the work that Lewis has done. Uh, he has not primarily been working on Christopher Rüstung, but on the Archbishop Olaf Engelbrechtsson, who um, uh, Christopher Rüstung was serving. But, you know, by telling the story of the Archbishop, you also have to tell the story about Christopher Rüstung. So this is his book from 2021. It's The Acts of St. Olaf. And what he's mainly investigating in what happened to the acts of St. Olaf that was supposedly kept in the cathedral in Trondheim, but went missing after the archbishop went to the Netherlands and has never been refound. It was immensely valuable. It was in gold and silver with um, a lot of jewels on it and so forth. So he has written a, a kind of a treasure hunt book, but I'm more interested than in the person, Christophe Rustung. And the question I've simply asked is, who was he? And several people have asked that question before, and they've given a lot of very different uh, answers. So Halftan Kult, most no, one of the most known Norwegian history professors and also a foreign minister during the Second World War, found, basically found him a cocky villain. You know, he's <laughs> not a very likable person at all. Uh, some has found him a pirate. More neutral is, of course, a sea commander and admiral. Uh, I would like to claim that he's very much a Renaissance politician. So there's made a lot of series, TV series and films, and there's written books about Italian Renaissance and the kind of politics, very violent politics you would find there. And I would claim that Christopher Rustig is very much this kind of a guy, highly educated, sophisticated, and brutal at the same time. It's a kind of a 
weird combination that was very much possible in the 16th century, no longer in the 17th century, for instance. But some has just seen him as an historical actor, uh, so which is the most you know, neutral approach to Christopher Rustin. But just keep these different definitions in mind. And the last slide, I'm going to try to see if he was all of them, or at least some of these things in his life. He was born, we, well, we don't know when he was born, probably 1500 approximately. He was born in the western part of Norway in the region Sunnordland, south of Bergen. His privileged manor was Sein, which is very close to the Barony Rosendal, which is, which is still such a privileged manor in the western part of Norway. A privileged manor was important because it meant that you had trade privileges. From a privileged manor, you could trade abroad without having to pay any taxes at all to the king. And that's what made this region in Norway the one with the most aristocrats. So it's, a heav it's heavily dense, uh, populated by aristocrats. And it's because of these trade privileges. His estates were basically mainly in Sunodland, but also in the re neighboring regions of Hardanger and, and Nordland. So it's all in the area north, east, and south of Bergen. His estate doesn't consist of many units, so 22 farms, but they're very productive units. I mean, they're very carefully picked. They produce every year an annual rent of 63 laufbars butter. So that's 970 kilos of butter paid in annual rent every year. So that makes it a fairly large estate, not more than one of the 100 largest estates in Norway at this time, but it's, it's maybe, but it's, it's fair enough. It's, it's a good estate, but it is not spectacular in any way. So what is important is that he's not born to be a prominent political figure and a wealthy person. He's born to be an aristocrat. And, he's, and as all aristocrats in this area, he would make his money on trade. And that's why he's later on also an admiral, because these young aristocrats are trained to trade, and it's a hands-on trade. They cut the middleman, meaning that they're sea captains on their own ships, transporting mainly timber to Northern Europe, the Netherlands, England, and Germany. So that's how they these guys make their fortune. They don't become rich from it, but they make a good, it's a, it's a good life. And he's also in the sources based, uh, explicitly called an aristocrat. So he's a, a nobleman, with a nobleman's privileges. Now, when you search up Christopher Rustin or Christopher Tronson at the internet, there will be a lot of speculation on who his father and mother was. The truth is we don't know. So all speculations are for me equally good basically. So I'm not gonna dwell on that at all. The only thing we know is that his father has also been an aristocrat and his mother as well. If there weren't both aristocrats, he wouldn't have been an aristocrat. So that's basically all we know. What is different from Christopher Rustin compared to other aristocrats from this region is his marriage. Now, to start with, some there's a source, and that source is not just any source. It is Queen Mary of Hungary and Bohemia, who re, uh, who recite, who was in the Netherlands and governing Netherlands for a very long period in the, the 16th century, it is Queen Mary of Hungary who says Christopher Rustung is a nephew of the Norwegian Archbishop. She's the only source for this information. And it is maybe reliable because she knew him very well, something I'm gonna talk about later on. At the same time, that means that the archbishop must have had a brother uh, named Trond, or could have also been a, 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 you know, that he had a sister, but we don't know. What we know is that the archbishop in general employed people that was related to him. So his brother was employed by him, 
and the archbishop also employed a, a nephew called Gauta, called Gauta Norweger, that means Gauta from Norway. So it wouldn't be surprising, but we don't know if that was the case. What we know is that Christopher Rüster was married to Karen Knutstatter Skanke. She was the daughter of the dean of the Tondheim Cathedral. That's important of two reasons. First of all, the dean of the Trondheim Cathedral, together with the canons of the cathedral, enjoy all the income from the Trondanes parish in northern Norway. That was the wealthiest parish in the entire country. It was Its wealth was based on revenues from stockfish trade, and they were just enormous. So Christopher Rüstung is married into a very wealthy family. Now, some of you might then want to stress that the dean of the cathedral is not supposed to have a daughter at all. That is quite true. It wasn't uncommon, though, that the higher level of the Catholic clergy in Norway in the 16th century had children, and the dean then obviously did. Now, being dean means that you have all this income from the Trondanes parish in northern Norway, but it is often, not always, but often, the dean who becomes the next archbishop. So Christopher Rüstung is married into a wealthy family, but potentially his father-in-law is actually going to be the next archbishop if there had not been a reformation. But more spectacular than his background is then actually his marriage. How did he get into this elite layer of society? We don't know. Uh, maybe he was a highly educated man, and I strongly believe he was. And he might have studied law abroad. Could, he could already at that time have met the archbishop. The archbishop himself studied in Rostock in Germany. Uh, and it might have been that Christopher Rüstung also studied there. What we do know is that the archbishop used him as prosecutor in a couple of spectacular criminal cases. The most spectacular is the case against Nils Lücke. I'm not going to go into detail, but the archbishop was in, in a very intense, long-running conflict with the lairds at Austrut, uh, at uh, the uh, end of the Trondheim Fjord. Nils Lücke was married into that family, and Christopher Rüstung basically um, was, he got him convicted and actually sentenced to death, but it was tricky to find anybody wanting to, willing to execute Nils Lick, who was such an important person in Norway. And it was actually Christopher Rüstung himself who has to carry the responsibility that he was finally killed in prison, actually. So Christopher Rüstung was used as a lawyer by the archbishop, and we also see that he acted as a judge in a civil case where the archbishop was not involved at all in 1535. So it it seems that he was an educated lawyer. He also seems to know very well the international law of war. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of incidents in his life when he's writing letters to the Danish Norwegian king, where he's making arguments, which is based on the international law of war. And seemingly he knew it very well. And also, we should keep in mind that when, when the Archbishop has fled from Norway because of the Reformation on ships uh, in, 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 in where Christopher Rüstung is in charge and ends up in the Netherlands, the Archbishop sends his Chancellor, Gaut de Norwegen, his nephew, and Christopher Rüstung to negotiate with the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. And you just don't send anybody to talk to the Emperor. And also their negotiations were very successful. So again, it seems to me that Christopher Rüstung must have been educated at most likely a German university uh, at some point. Gauta Norweger suddenly had studied in Cologne. And we also see that he later on in the 1530s acts as a lawyer, both for the Count of Buren, the Dutch Admiral Maximilian of Egemond Buren, and uh, probably uh, Christopher Rüstung had also studied law. Again, this is not common from an aristocrat from Sunhordland and, and the south of Bergen. 
but it would have been common for somebody within that elite layer of society where Christopher Rustum would be present. Another thing that is surprising with Christopher Rustum is the marriage of two of his daughters. Now he has eight children, seven daughters, uh, and five daughters are married in Sundhodlan. So that's where he origins from. And they marry into this layer of aristocrats doing hands-on trade, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But his two oldest daughters don't. They marry abroad. And most spectacular is, of course, the story of Anna Rüstung, his oldest daughter, and also the daughter which seems to have been closest uh, to his father. We'll, I'll talk about that later on. His daughter meets James Hepburn in Copenhagen. Now, it, at that time, this is the uh, 1560s, early 1560s, Christopher Rustung is an admiral for the Danish-Norwegian king, and he lives in most of the time in Copenhagen in Denmark with his family. James Hepburn, the fourth Earl of Bothwell in Scotland, is the Scottish admiral. So, there, so Christopher Rustung is the admiral of the Danish-Norwegian fleet, James Hepburn of the Scottish fleet, and it is quite natural that these two men meet when James Hepburn is, is in Copenhagen. At that time, at least from all the sources we know, Anna Rüstung and James Hepburn is engaged. And James Hepburn take, brings with him Anna first to Amsterdam, later on to Paris, and then to Scotland. And it seems they were living together in Edinburgh for a couple of years. Now, they were only engaged, but being engaged at this time equals to being married. Why he put off the marriage? Well, he was an opportunist. I mean, he is a man who is constantly looking for a better deal. And he had a history of several mistresses, and he's also going to abandon Anna and uh, Mary, in the end, Mary, Queen of Scots. I'm going to return to that in a moment. But what is important for me here is the description we have of when uh, James um, Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell, met Anna in Copenhagen. She was described as dark and exotic, dripping with pearls and precious stones, clad in a red damask tunic, a gold chain around her head, etc. And we have from several sources, this uh, gold chain around her head is described in several sources. So it must have been spectacular, uh, a, a gold chain. She seemed very, very wealthy at the time, which is probably the reason why she got engaged with James Hepburn. He's later on imprisoned, and she actually gets a... Uh, passport, we would call it today, from Mary Queen of Scots to escape to Norway and wait for James Hepburn there. He never arrives. Well, he actually does in 1567. Here you have a picture of James Hepburn. He was a very handsome man, risk taker, big time risk taker. That's also why his destiny is what it was. Uh, but most important for me right now is there was a source found by Frederick Sheen in 1872. It was published in 1875. And it's a letter from a former mistress of uh, the Earl of Bothwell. And as I said, he had several former mistresses, but this is one of them. And in that letter, she claimed that the Earl had met, met a rich noblewoman in or from Denmark, that's Anna Rüstung, which had lent him, when they got engaged, 40,000 Jochum dollars. It's if that's half the truth, just half the truth, that's an enormous sum. And it means that Christopher Rustin was enormously rich. And he might have been. But that is maybe the reason why she was an in, interesting as a uh, for, for the Earl of, of Bathwell, James Hepburn. Uh, what I, I'm this is not a lecture about her destiny, so I'm just going to be very brief. 
Uh, what happened is that she got a passport. She escaped to Norway in 1561. J James Happen was supposed to come afterwards. He didn't. He just stayed in Scotland. He actually married another woman, divorced her, plotted against the King of Scotland and probably killed him before he married Mary, the Queen of Scots. And this is why there was a rebellion. He had to flee. He went with his ship to Shetland and from Shetland over to Norway, where he shipwrecked. And he was transported to Bergen. And who was waiting for him there? Very angry. That was Anna Rustung. <laughs> and uh, she sued him for breaking the engagement. And uh, uh, he was sentenced to give her his ship. That was basically all he owned. And $100 annually payment for the rest of her life. Uh, she, of course, never got those hundred dollars because after he had given her his ship, he was uh, put in jail and he died in jail in, in Denmark later on. So that's that's the end of that story. It's a fascinating story. But that Christopher Rusto had a daughter who could marry the fourth Earl of Bothwell, could have married him, at least was engaged to him, is quite sensational that she might have lent him $40,000. And again, if that's half the truth, we're still talking about an enormous amount of money. That's even also spectacular. And what is interesting is that this is not recent. And this is the, the information that I got from Julian Goodard. My friend Julian in Edinburgh is an expert on witchcraft trials and a spectacular witchcraft trial in, in Scot Scottish history is the trial against William Stewart of Lottery. Now, William Stewart of Lottery was married to Dorothea Trunsi. That is another daughter of Christopher Rüstung. They didn't marry when he was at the peak of his power. So they married early in the 1560s sometime, about the same time as Anna met the Earl of Bothwell. Uh, he becomes an important political figure as the Earl of Bothwell has to flee from Scotland and with the fall of Maria Stuart, as Queen of Scots, because he is the agent for the Earl of Moray, who is to become the next Scottish king. So he's his ambassador. And when the Earl of Moray actually becomes king of Scotland, he's made Lord Lyon, which is a very important position in Scotland. So Dorothea uh, Trunsi or Dorothea Rüstung didn't marry at, at this level of, of society, but her husband would rise to this highest level in Scottish society in the 1560s. Now, if only William Stewart had been happy with what he had achieved, but he was also looking for a better position. So he actually got involved in witchcraft. Um, he made a, he was a part, or he took the initiative for magical ritual in uh, Hollywood Park in Edinburgh to see if he would become the next Scottish king himself. And he actually asked three witches. This is almost uh, Macbeth. So he asked three witches if he was to marry, marry Queen of Scots and become the next Scottish king. Now, all of this was discovered. He was uh, sentenced to death and burned at the stake. Now, usually when you're burned at the stake, your entire inheritance, all your property goes to the, the king. In this case, we know that Dorothea Trunsi wrote a letter to the king asking for the permission to actually inherit her deceased husband and she got that permission. And from then on, she disappears from our sources. She probably went back to Norway, but we don't know for sure. So, but what does this tell us about Christopher Rüstung? Well, he has a fine, but not spectacular background. He's very well married and he seems to be well-educated and he seems to be very wealthy. At least that's possibly the reason why his daughter married so well in Scotland. So what do we know of his life? So we're now going to the Netherlands. And I'm going to talk about his adventures at Eindhausen, which is up here, Deventer, 
which is down here, and wäre, which is down here. So let's first move to uh, Einkhausen. Christopher Rusten, what we know of him is that he rises to become the Archbishop's Admiral. He's in charge of the Archbishop's fleet. When the Archbishop in 1536 feels threatened because the Reformation has taken place in Denmark, and he feels or is afraid that the Reformation is also going to take place in Norway, he sends Christopher Rustung to the Netherlands to negotiate with Queen Mary of Hungary to get a fleet to Norway to pick up him, his archives, and his treasures. It is Gauter Norweger, the Chancellor, and Christopher Rustung, who goes to the Netherlands uh, and has this negotiation and returns to Norway with three ships. It's the Löwen von Enghuysen, which carries 109 men. It's Christoffel von Enghuysen, which carries 98 men. And it's Boyer von Enghuysen, which carries 48 men. If I wasn't sure, Christopher Rüstung had gone to the Netherlands to negotiate with Queen Mary of Hungary, I would have almost been certain when I see the size of the sh ships. This is his favored fleet. Two large ships and one light one. 48 men is not his favored size. He would usually go for a ship uh, with about 30 men. And he would be a commander on the smallest ship. Why? I'm going to tell you a little bit later. But this is the favored size of his fleet. And he takes that fleet to uh, Trondheim. And in 1537, he returns to Netherlands with the archbishop, uh, with his treasures and his archives. This is Einkhuysen, which you can see is a heavily fortified port town. Uh, and it was a favored spot for trade for Norwegians. So they knew the, the, the town very well that the Archbishop had his partners in trade in Enkhuysen in the Netherlands. <coughs> so Christopher Rustung as Admiral brings the Archbishop Olaf Engelbrechtsson safely to um, first Enkhuysen and then they move on to Deventer. Uh, but they lose one ship. And they're attacked outside Fleckerö in the south of Norway, and they lose one ship there. But two ships arrive in Einkhuysen, and then they move on to Deventer, also a heavily fortified uh, port town. Now, Christopher Rüstung is the admiral, but he has already, in 1536, a history for looting ships. The first time he does that is in 1527. He claims to do that as a privateer. And a pirate and a privateer are two very different things. So a pirate is an outlaw who's uh, plundering whatever he can find on sea. A privateer has a license from a sovereign, a king or a queen or any kind of magnet with that kind of authority to plunder the ad, uh, uh, enemy's ships. But that doesn't mean that you can just plunder any ship. It means that you can, you can capture a ship, take it ashore, and then a court of law is gonna decide if this is a legal capture or an illegal capture. If it's in, illegal, you have to let go of the ship with its crew and possibly pay compensation. So that's how a privateer is working. Christopher Rüstung claimed to be a privateer in 1527 when he's uh, capturing Scottish, German, and Dutch, Dutch ships. A court of law finds that his capture has been illegal. He still never returns the treasures he's captured. He does the same thing in 1536. Uh, he, uh, he's on his way back to Norway with three ships from uh, the Netherlands. You know, two large ones, one smaller one. And on his way, he is capturing the ships of a Dutchman called Geert Geertson, 
Uh, very valuable. I mean, the price is stipulated to 555 Carolus Gilders, so it's a fairly large amount of money. It's later again found in a court of law to be illegal. Christopher Rüstung never returns the 555 Carolus Gilders. Uh, on his, so that's on his way back to Trondheim going down again to the Netherlands with the Archbishop on board, with his, his treasures and his archives. They actually stop at Eustrot, which has been for a long time the enemies, enemies of the Archbishop, and they loot that manor and takes all the treasures they can find and bring on. Now, if you wonder why I'm stopping with all this looting, it is because I have to try to explain why Christopher Rüstung possibly was so rich. Now I think you're getting the idea. <laughs> He's plundering ships. In 1437, he moves on and he settles in the Vere, which is a heavily fortified, very small town, very strategically placed in the Netherlands. Uh, and there's several pri privateers and pirates operating from this area. He's staying at an inn of Jeronimus and Marike Schoenewelt, and his family is not there, only his daughter, Anna. So if you have been Googling different, you know, general, uh, different, uh, and seen the age of his daughter, Anna, it is mainly wrong because she's estimated to be born 1540, but she was definitely already born in 1537 and of an age that made it possible for her to be with her father without her mother. He has a privateer license from Queen Mary of Hungary. Again, I mean, there, he, it was Queen Mary he negotiated with in 1536. He gets his license from her in 1537, but also from the Admiral in, in Vere, Maximilian of Egmont Buren, and the Governor Cornelius de Schepper. His main ship is a ship of 100, 120 ton. And with that ship, he starts capturing large ships. So this is about the size of his ship. Doesn't carry many cannons. So already on his first voyage with only one ship, in three days, he captures a ship of 38 ton, 60 ton, that's not much, and 280 ton, that's quite a lot, and a, a ship of an unknown size. And he uses two of these, he adds two of these ships to his fleet, and then he seizes another nine ships. So he's just extremely efficient. And his tactics are always the same. So he sails up with three ships, but two of the ships are only for what he captures on these other ships. They're just transporting goods for him. He's always favoring a small ship, a crew with 30 people, and that's, that's the ship he uses to attack the larger ships. He hides behind, outside Vera, there are small islands, and the sea is quite shallow. So with a small ship, he can hide behind islands. When the large ship has passed, he's sailing up behind it, it ruins its steering mechanism, attacks it, and captures it. If he fails, he can always flee over the shallow banks at the sea with his small ship, and a large ship cannot follow him. It's a classical pirate tactic, and that's what he is employing. And he's extremely uh, effective, as we will see. The Danish-Norwegian king, King, king Christian III, takes the effort to write to the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and to ask him to stop Christopher Rüstung, which he calls an gemeiner Seeräuber, a common pirate, because he's such a pain to the Danish-Norwegian king. We'll see that he's going to be a pain to a lot of people by and by because of this a very effective tactic of his. His problem is that in 1537, He's not that far into his privateer career, 
there is actually a peace made between Denmark and the Holy uh, Roman Empire. So he can no longer act as a privateer because Denmark is not the enemy of the Holy Roman Empire anymore. So his license is not valid. He still does. That's why the Danish Norwegian Chris, uh, King Christian III is complaining. The one who protects him is again Queen Mary of, of Hungary. She says she has no idea of what the king, the claim the king makes. You know, the, she doesn't know that he is conducting any privateer activities at all. He is, and everybody knows he is. So she's protecting him. Even worse for Christopher Rustring is that in 1539, there's a peace made between the Netherlands and France. We can no longer attack French ships either. Now he moves in 1539 to Friesland, which is the area between the Netherlands and Germany, where he uh, from the um, he gets a license to be a privateer, but basically nobody recognized these licenses of the sovereign of, of Friesland. These people were treated as, as pirates in general. So a colleague of him, Franz Brehme, who was also a privateer with a license from Friesland, he was caught and all of his crew and he himself was beheaded at the shores of the North Sea for piracy. So in 1539, Christopher Rustring is living a fairly dangerous life. He claims to be a privateer, but he is seen by everybody as a pirate. So he leaves the, the waters of the Netherlands, and it's a quite spectacular thing. He has a crew of 26, a very small ship, and he just sails to the place where he's the most wanted. That's Norway. And he loots and burns the Utstein Abbey, and then, which is outside the city of Stavanger, and then he goes to Stavanger with his small crew, and he loots and burns the bishop's palace. This is when it becomes dangerous because there's a counterattack and 24 of his entire crew of 26. It simply means that Christopher Rustung and his second in command escapes. And that's all that escapes. Uh, this was too much. It was too much of a risk. He still makes it back to the Netherlands. We don't know how. But from 1540, he just escapes all records. Because now a court of law has finally decided that his looting of the ship of Gert Gerson in 1536 was uh, illegal, and he has to repay his uh, 555 guilders, and he doesn't. He just disappears. All we know is that he leaves his daughter with Marie Kishunewelt at the inn he's living in, at Vere, and is gone. How could he disappear? Well, we don't know because he disappears. He's gone for two years. Nothing is heard of him. My guess, and that's just a guess, it is that his old protector is protecting him again. It's Queen Mary of Hungary. There is no one else with that kind of a power in the Netherlands except from the sovereign, the de, fac de facto sovereign of the Netherlands, Mary of Hungary, who could protect him. But he's away for two years, and then he reemerges in Denmark, in Copenhagen. He's now employed by the king, his old enemy. I think the king thought, you know, uh, I can have Christopher Rusting as an enemy and a pain till I finally capture him, or I can make him my admiral and he's on my team. That's what the king chooses. So suddenly, he's, he's not made an admiral immediately. He's a commander in the Danish-Norwegian Navy in 1542. What is his first task? His first task is to lead a fleet containing 10,000 men to invade the Netherlands. He's just turning on his old friends. And maybe that's the proposition he's made to the king, you know? Make me a commander of your, uh, in your fleet and I'll help you invade the Netherlands. That's what he does. There are in incidences taking place that makes the whole invasion a fiasco. It has nothing to do with Christopher Rustung, but it, it fails. But he continues as a commander of the fleet. <clears throat> and in 14, 1543, he returns to the Netherlands, but now as a privateer on a small ship with 20 men. 
same tactics, but now he employs it on the Dutch, and he seizes several ships. And the citizens of Amsterdam are up, are um, upset, and they want uh, a a fleet to capture Christopher Rustung, and the governor René van Calon takes the initiative to equip ships actually to fight Christopher Rustung, but the whole operation is stopped by Queen Mary of Hungary again, and he escapes once again. If, so that this is, and I could continue with his adventures at sea uh, till he dies in 1565 as an admiral uh, of the Danish Norwegian fleet. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll just return to this question, how could he be so rich? And very briefly, first of all, the archbishop who fled, who Christopher Rustun and helped flee Trondheim to the Netherlands with all his riches and his archives, died in 1538. Then most people went home. The two who didn't go home was Goethe Norberger and Christopher Rustung. Again, the chancellor, the nephew of the archbishop, and Christopher Rustung. They didn't go home. And we know what Christopher Rustung was doing. Now, what is important is that the archbishop left personal property, quite a lot of personal property to be inherited. Who inherited the wealth? of the Archbishop. We don't know. Could it been Christopher Rustum got a share of this wealth? Maybe. Maybe that's a, rich, a reason why he seems to become so rich. But the Archbishop also left a huge treasure which belonged to the Archbishopric. Who was supposed to inherit that? After four years uh, of, of a court, uh, after a trial of four years in Deventer, it was decided that the Elector Frederick of, of uh, Palatine was to inherit it all. Uh, and that's fine. But Queen Mary of Hungary decided, so this is outside court, she decides that the, uh, the Elector Frederick only gets the treasures after all creditor claims are fulfilled. Was Christopher Rüstum one of the creditors of the Archbishop? We don't know. If he was, he would get a share of that wealth. Well, this is Queen Mary of Hungary, the real sovereign of the Netherlands at this time. Was she the reason why he was so well protected and could carry out this business as a privateer? Definitely, she played at least an important role. We don't know how large a role. But the privateering probably made Christopher Rüstung very wealthy. Maybe also it is, maybe also he got a share of the treasure after the, the archbishop and a share in his private wealth. We don't know. But what is worth interesting is again to return to the letter of the mistress of the Earl of Bothwell, claiming that he had met a, a woman, a noble woman in Copenhagen, and had lent from her. $40,000. Those dollars are called Juchum dollars. Juchum dollars is produ was produced in Hungary. It, and did ever Christopher Rustum get that amount of money, which is enormous wealth, from Mary of Hungary again? We don't know. But she is the most interesting, actually, figure in the story of Christopher Rustum, but we don't know exactly what the relationship was. Uh, and I'll just move to the last slide. I asked the question, who was Christopher Rüstung? Was he a cocky villain? Yes, I would say he was. Uh, the way he acts as a privateer, uh, he's a big risk taker and he succeeds. He's close to being killed in Stavanger, uh, and he has to disappear between 1540 and 42, but he manages, even he, despite the fact he takes all these risks. Was he a pirate? Well, at least he's found a pirate in 1527 and 1536 because he never repays the uh, um, booty that he's captured from, from the ships. Was he a sea commander? Yes, he was. For the Archbishop of, of Trondheim, and later for the Danish-Norwegian king. 
Was he a kind of a Renaissance politician? I already affirmed that, yes, he was highly educated, highly sophisticated. We find from the sources he's associating with, well, Queen Mary of Hungary. He has talked with the emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor. Emperor, he has, he, he, he talks to dukes and, and, and uh, um, other nobility uh, in, in Europe. He's sophisticated and he's brutal. As a pirate, he's brutal. So he's very much a Renaissance politician, historical actor, yes, very much so. Uh, he's very important in this political period with the Reformation and after Reformation in Norwegian history. So he's basically all of what he's been accused of from the very neutral historical actor to the villain, I would say. So that will very much be my, my talk, uh, Joel. Well, let's uh, let's open it up. That's really a fascinating story. It's uh, there's a lot more in there than than I ever uh, knew about. Although I've a lot of what I uh, knew about him came from Shane's book, uh, The Pirate and Admiral. Mm. Uh, but this is much more uh, much more extensive. Wonderful storyteller you are. You made it come just alive. Thank you. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Alex. I have this question for you. Why would a monarch, a sitting monarch, uh, provide such cover for a scoundrel? What does she get? She must be getting something constantly to feed her protection. Would have been several things. Of course, you know, he's, he's such a successful privateer. You know, he, he brings in wealth from enemy ships. So that might be one thing. Um, but didn't she give him cover before he started doing that? So it, something was going on. Yes, I've been, <laughs> I, I've been speculating. Uh, and I want to write a book about him one day. And I might then continue speculating because I've concluded in my speculation, which is, of course, I have no so It's not based on sources at all. There must have been some kind of an affair between the two of them. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, but I I can't prove it, but she appears all the time. When he needs protection, she's there protecting him against her own people. I mean, in 1543, the citizens of Amsterdam are just so upset, and they've equipped all the ships, everything. They're ready to sail out, and she stops the whole thing. Well, he must have been passing on a, a, a percentage, is what I was thinking, you know. Probably. Special stagecoach that goes to Queen Mary of Hungary with <laughs> crates of gold bullion. But also, uh, this from, from several sources, we know his daughter at parties were wearing this golden chain around her head. It must have been spectacular since the since so many sources are referring to it. Uh, and there is a a Danish historian who records in the eighteen eighties or eighteen nineties how these stories are still told in Denmark. So, and I, I'm, I'm thinking also that that golden change is not something you pick up on the market. This is something made for a queen probably, and, and maybe then given as a gift to, to Anna. The, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that uh, he ended up uh, owning, I think you said 22 farms in, Southwest uh, Norway. Uh, did that come from his own uh, background in in Syme and and in that area, or or, or uh, did he uh, gain more from from the Danish king or somebody like that? No, the twenty two farms are probably well. They're not probably. They are his family estate. Yeah. So when he goes. When he transports the Archbishop to the Netherlands in 1537, his entire estate is confiscated. But when he returns to Denmark in 1542, the estate is returned to him, and that's the 22 farms. Uh -huh. uh, he also gets a estate in Denmark, uh, in the south of Shelland, the island where Copenhagen is situated, Sealand. But that's only for his lifetime. 
So the 22 farms is his family property. That's what he inherited himself from his father. Ah, okay. So, uh, then uh, uh, he, uh, I, I, at least my understanding is that he kind of parcels those out to his daughters uh, yes. later. And, and so they, they each get uh, you know, some nice inheritance and a nice farm and, and so on. Mm. Mm. That's right. Uh, and uh, they all get their share. Uh, and Anna, uh, she she did, well. Some some sources say that Anna gets signed, but that's not the case. Uh, she gets Helvik. Uh, uh. Uh, so so for those who are interested in the Moats, that's where the illegitimate illegitimate son of Axel Moat later on lives. That's Helvik. So that's where Anna is actually. That's the farm she gets from this um, transaction. Interesting. Uh, I, I, I was always kind of Im, impressed by that uh, because I mean uh, he has this illegitimate son, but well, he gets a farm too. So, you know. <laughs> and, and it is not just any farm; it is a very profitable farm because it has a very large forest, which is in a valley, so it's it's easy to get the timber to the shore and transport it onto Europe. Uh, and it has a, a river and hence a sawmill and everything. So this is, if you were to pick one farm and you couldn't get sign, this is what you would have picked. Interesting. Hmm. So, I mean, it's interesting how this, this story, at least on that end of things, kind of dovetails with the story you told us about Rosendahl and the shipping and the Mowats and how that all, all comes together. And the Mowat were also sea admirals. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question, another one, if I might. Um, the speaker early on defined a, a class of manor, manor called a privileged manor. And I'm wondering how we discover which ones those are. Like, would Aga or Askic be one of those? Or is there a list or something? Mm -hmm. uh Aga used to be, but that's back in the Middle Ages. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what 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 you I call it a privileged manor in Norwegian. It's called a setegård, and setegård simply means the place or the farm gård where a nobleman or an aristocrat is uh. sitting, that is living. So uh, any aristocrat can pick one farm which has this, that he owns, that has this kind of privileges. And that means that anything you trade from that farm, uh, it, you don't have to pay any taxes. And this became in the 16th century, a big problem from the king because there's so much trade going on, he's missing out the taxes. And he does some political, well, maneuvers at the end of the 16th century, and he actually gets control over that trade as well. But Aga used to be, but it lost its um, its status as such an asetigo because the owners would lose their aristocratic status. One way of doing that is marrying non-aristocratic. Okay, thank you. Well, one of the things I think I read in in uh, Sheen's book, but uh, Tona has told me that it's, it's not clear that it's true. Uh, is that he's he ends up being buried under the Kvinherad uh, church. Yeah, I doubt that very much. Okay. It seems to me that he uh, dies in Copenhagen, at least a couple of months before he, well, it seems to me that he dies in Denmark. Okay. Uh, and also the story goes that Anna Rüstung, his oldest daughter, is is buried in the Kvinnerad church. It's probably not so. It seems to me that she also dies in Denmark. Okay. We don't know. That's that's important, of course. Sure. So just trying to add to the tourist attraction of the of the church. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would claim. I I also am a, a descendant uh, from one of his daughters, but all the time. Uh, this was really enjoyable. All the time, I kept thinking, when did he have time to be a father? And when did he, <laughs> how, where was his family during all this time? And how were they avoiding the troubles that he was creating? 
Yes. Uh, I've been looking for sources to just, you know, where where was his wife all this time? You know, when, when did they meet? When did they have time to make children at all? I have never found any sources about her whereabouts. Might be that he was clever and, you know, kept her somewhere where she was safe and people, you know, didn't know much about her. Maybe Scotland uh, could have been. I mean, it could have been dangerous for her to be in, in Denmark and in the Netherlands at different times. And it's very strange that he is in Vera for several years, at least uh, four years, three years, sorry, three to four years, with his oldest daughter, and there's no mentioning of any other family member. Hmm. Yeah, it's very strange, and um, I just hope to find that source one day. Uh, hmm. that there's more sources. In, in the Netherlands, I don't think we'll find anything more than what Louis Sicking has found, but in Scotland, there's more sources to be investigated. Hmm. Was there a hot spot in Scotland for his where he resided the most or not that we know about no okay no thanks so uh so, so there, apart... was, there was you made me think about something alan that i've never thought of before but he one of his daughters and his granddaughter both stays for a while on Shetland. Hmm. Actually, his granddaughter stays there for 20 years, hiding for the Norwegian king. <laughs> Very effectful because it's, you know, you don't go to Shetland. And if you do, it's going to, you know, somebody's going to know before you get to the, the hiding of somebody. Maybe they were on Shetland. I've never thought of that. Uh, but I'll try to investigate it. Which, which daughter was that? Now, uh, his daughter, Elsa, who That's later it. marries uh, Andrew Mowat, has quite a lot of properties and economic interests in Shetland. Right. Uh, and she seems to have been to Shetland uh, a couple of times. And her, yes, and a, well, there's another grandchild. She actually goes to, um, uh, oh, well, if you go to Eshanes on, on Shetland, Hugeland at Eshanes in, in, in Shetland, that's where she stays for 20 years because she married her cousin, which was illegal. It was seen as incest. And they escaped to Shetland and stayed for 20 years and had quite a comfortable life because he was acting, her husband was acting as a, a commissioner for Axel Mowat. Ah. That's a different story, of course. <laughs> Do you, um, do you suppose uh, in his uh, piracy years that um, it was just random success? Or do you think he had sort of eyes and ears on shore helping uh, his ability to attack all the right ships? I think it's not accidental that he stays at an inn. That's where people drink and talk. Mm. And it is quite obvious that Marik, uh, Marike Schoenewelt seems to be the one who reports information to him. Yeah. We can't, I can't prove it, but it seems to be the system. Wow. Uh, so I, I think he had eyes and ears on shore, yes. Okay. There, there was also that uh, period, uh, I think, uh, well, I forget exactly when, but there's a lot of political problems in Norway uh, between uh, uh, Olav and uh, other uh, aristocrats or in, in, in Norway. And, and Christopher played a pretty significant role in, in all of that, too, I think. And ended he up, did. Ended up in, in, uh, in, uh, in jail in uh, Bergen for a while at uh, <laughs> Rosencrantz. Uh, castle or something like that yes he was in the rosenkrantz castle and he's very upset with good reasons because he is promised that he can come to bergenhus and negotiate uh with the lord at, at the castle and he's captured so the promise is broken and he writes this very angry letter where he you know mentions the 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 the, the international laws of war 
and he says, you know, th this is against all rules. Uh, and he, so he had a good reason to be upset, actually, at that time. Uh, yes, he's very involved in unrest in the 50, late 1520s and, and 1530s. And to some extent, it, the unrest is due to the fact that, you know, the Reformation is coming and what will happen then with church property. And basically, he's just fighting with other ambitious young noblemen to get control over these especially these stockfish areas in Norway, because that stockfish trade was so lucrative and you want control over those areas. And he's fighting for the archbishop, I think, because it will give him control over these areas, while others are, just want a reformation because then they can get control. And it, it turns out that you know some of the pro-reformation people are Catholics and some of those fighting for the archbishop are really Protestants. They didn't really care much for for religion. They were interested in revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, after they got Olaf uh, kicked out of out of, out of Norway, there there were some pretty unkind things said about him by the Lutheran uh, ministry. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite true. I wouldn't trust it all. Definitely not. No. Well, it's pretty it, it's pretty hypocritical, right? Somebody that's a pirate. And at the same time, he's trying to draw from the from the letter of the law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in one hand, at the other hand, I think for much of the time, he could claim to be a privateer, but he's not repaying the booty from 1527 and 1536. He definitely should have done so. So at that time, he is a pirate. Yes. And that is, I agree, hypocritical. It's just, uh, it's just entertaining, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. Uh, that's absolutely true. They should make a movie. It would be a blockbuster. <laughs> As I said, I want to really write a book about his life. It's, it's going to first be in 2026, but it is such an adventurous life. Um, and also, you know, it's all, always interesting with a character who's not black and white. You can't say he's good. You can't say he's bad. He's, he's probably just both. Yeah, one, one of the things that uh, I've said is that uh, in all families, uh, there are... Uh, Black sheep and and heroes, and Christopher was both. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I uh, uh, thought about calling him the uh, the last Viking. <laughs> well, it is interesting because his tactics are Viking tactics. The ta mm -hmm. the Vikings also favored small, light ships that were easy to maneuver, and that's also his tactics and. He's attacking these huge ships with very small vessels, really. And, and his tactics are just brilliant. Yeah. Very colorful character. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if modern military modern navies could learn a thing or two but from your <laughs> book when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the part about not giving back the loot. <laughs> <laughs> now, when has that ever not happened in history? Oh, I'm going to have to go, but thank you so much. This is very entertaining and, and interesting, very useful. Yeah, thank Thanks you. So much. Okay. Uh, uh, last last call for questions. Otherwise, uh, let's uh, thank uh, the speaker. Uh, thank you very much for a, a really terrific uh, story. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank I, you. Thanks, Sharon. I, I have one more sort of side question um, because uh, we uh, do. Do you know uh, this uh, guy Ode Hundergord? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, maybe I'm mispronouncing the name. Uh, he's he's got a book called Varfellus Flex History. Uh, it's uh, I, I think it's a very <laughs> limited uh, printing. 
yeah. But uh, it's uh, uh, I, I managed to get a copy of it, and it's it's a beautiful book. Uh, okay. But he uh, has done um, uh, has done a lot of research on you know Christopher's in there very prominently, but yeah, along yeah. With all the other old families, and a pretty good job of of uh, 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 researching it with references and. If there's a controversy, he says, "Well, we're not sure about this, but maybe it's this, and maybe it's this." So he's, cool. I think, he's honest. Cool. Uh, he's 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 at the University of Oslo in fisheries, uh, or was anyway. I think he's an older. Oh. Uh, I think he's a little bit older now. Uh, okay, don't know the book. Send me the reference. I really I want to look at it. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Okay, well, again, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, talking in the future. Thank you very much for inviting me. So I'll just leave. Bye bye. So I'm going to hit the end button here. See you, Joel. See ya.